I didn't care about none of that stuff. I'd come up Yankee land and they was eating some kind of, some, I don't know, tuna fish out of a can. <laughs> <laughs>
And 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 4, you may not be blind physically, but we are blind spiritually. And uh, he was he was, uh, he was a beggar in verse number 35, as you can see. But we see that his destination, his description. But we see, look at this, we see his desire in verse number 36. It says, In hearing the multitude, he passed, he passed by and asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth came and passed by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he, all he wanted was, was to receive his sight. He, he knew that uh, mankind could not help him, but it had to be Jesus. It had to be uh, the Savior that could help him. His desire is that he wanted to get to Jesus to have a change. We see his cry. We see in verse number 39, we see the criticism. Uh, it says in verse number 39, And they went before him, rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. And it says, But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. So in spite of people, in spite of uh, everybody's opinion on him, he wanted to get to Jesus. He had a desire to get to Jesus. And he was not going to let anybody stand in his way so he could get to him. Right. And he had some determination, as we'll see later on, that he is going to get to Jesus no matter who stands in his way, no matter what, what, what obstacle comes to him. And I, we, we see this in our day and time. We must be able to uh, get, get past the criticism. And we must be able to see in, in verse number 40 through 42 the compassion. And we see the cry, the criticism, the compassion of our Savior. But we see, uh, and fourthly, we see his distraction. In verse number 39, look at it. The distraction is the people that went before him. You look at verse number uh, 37, it says, And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. Then you jump on over to 39. They which went before him rebuked him. So not only did they tell him that Jesus is near, but they said, oh, well, you cannot, uh, don't even worry about it. Don't even bother trying to get to him. But he says uh, that he should not hold his peace. Actually, he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more. He said, in spite of anything that y'all say, I'm going to get to Jesus because I've got a desire. I, I've got a need that I want to uh, bring to him. And so he had his desire. It was his distraction. And it's, it's the same people that told him that Jesus is near. And so, we, and I, I tell you, it's, it's such a, a beautiful story in verse number 40. Uh, it says that Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him. So Jesus even had a desire to, to he says, well, what do you want? And Jesus already knew what he wanted. But he, he looked in verse number 41 saying, what would thou, uh, what, what thou shalt, sorry, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. He had a desire that he wanted to receive his sight, but he, in spite of his, his, his distraction, in spite of all of that, he got to Jesus in his determination. Fifthly, and we see his determination in verse number uh, 39. I won't read it again, but look at verse number uh, 42 and 43. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately, not, not days later, not, not, right. not months later, it says, immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Our lives is not supposed to be self-centered. Right. It's not supposed to bring glory and honor to us. But we're yeah. supposed to bring honor and glory to God. We're supposed to live a life that we follow Him, glorifying God. And when people see it, they glorify God with us. It is, it is not that we desire praise for ourselves. It's not that we, we are supposed to be prideful. That is, uh, as has been said today, that it's a sin. We are to bring honor and glory uh, to our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And, and uh, He makes a difference when He passes by in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. Yep. And uh, His life became new. His, his, his sight became new. Hey, his, his mood to changed. He followed Him. He right. said, man, he's done so much for me already. He has, he has gave me my sight. I, 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 long to, I long to follow him. I long to glorify him. And that should be our life today. Said, what is your purpose? It is to follow God, to glorify God, to bring honor and glory unto him. But see, his, he, he, wanted to, he wanted to bring honor and glory to him. And that should be our life today. When Jesus passes by, I'm glad he makes a difference. Amen. I'm glad that he's got enough. Hey, when I when I pass by, I pass by in the end, I ain't got enough power to make much of a difference. But I'm glad when Jesus passes by, he desires to save. As I have said earlier today, he desires to that uh, we, we go and, and talk tell people about the Lord, but I'm glad that we can tell them that when he does make a change, 
But when he does save you, he'll make a change. Yeah. You don't have to stay the way that you are. That's and right. uh, that's what people want to hear today. And uh, if they had told him that uh, Bartimaeus said, hey, you can't come because uh, when Jesus uh, touches you, you're still going to be blind. No, he, he knew that when he went to when he went to see Christ and went to ask uh, what he wanted, he knew that he would receive his sight. And immediately he received his sight. And so I'm glad that we've got a God. We've got the Lord. When he passes by, he sure makes a difference. Thank Amen. you. Thank you, Amen. Brother Perkins. Amen. When the Lord passes by, he does make a difference. When did he pass by your life? I'm not asking you when you said you did a prayer. I'm asking you when he made a difference in your life. When did the Lord make a difference in your life? Because just because you said your little prayer didn't mean you made a difference. I'm not meaning everybody to say the reality is. When he passes by, he makes a difference. And people will see a difference. I'm not even just talking about the salvation. I'm talking about there's times you've got you've got yourself blinded because of some sin in your life. But when Jesus passes by, it'll make a difference. And, the, and people will see a difference. Mm -hmm. Amen. When you did that in your life, and when I saw it, Amen. Amen. Yes, when I saw it, I'm like part of man. Yeah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. It's good, brother. I appreciate it. Matt, uh, let's see. Let's go to Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts. Amen. And. Uh, Let's look at chapter 8 of the book of Acts. Amen. Acts chapter 8. Uh, let's read verse 1 through, let's see, down through verse 4, I guess. Read these first four verses. It says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Uh, and at that time there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and him and men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching. The word. Father, help me in the next few moments as we look into your word. God, I pray that you help me to be an encouragement. Help me, I pray, to just communicate well the thoughts you put in my heart. And the Lord, just pray to bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's, uh, it's an interesting day in which we live. Um, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some things that might not, might not set so well, but, um, you know, Politics has run rampant in our country, and there's a huge focus on it. And I go all the way back to Obama, and um, I, I chuckle because I hear people all the way back during the Obama administration, I heard people saying, well, there's going to be another civil war. And then, of course, the, everything was so bad, everyone starts all this prepping business and all this stuff, rather than preparing to see the Lord, they're preparing to <laughs> keep some document or something. Anyways... And, uh, and so we got all this focus and all of these thoughts and all of these intents. And I say to myself, well, the most decorated U.S. military soldier ever uh, had to lie and try four or five times at 14 years old to sign up for the military during World War II. He was only about five foot or four foot 11 or so. And at 14 years old, he was doing everything he could to get into the uh, World War II so he could go to the European conflict and risk being slaughtered to death by the Germans. And now we've got 30 year olds that won't get out of mom and dad's basement and get off the video games and we're going to have a civil war. Uh -huh. They're going to pick up arms. They're going to be prepared. Let me tell you something. We live in a day and age where we are so at ease and have so much comfort we don't even realize how bad it actually is. Come on. Okay. There's, a, there's some, and you can think what you want, there's some older shows that I watch, and one of them had to do with uh, this detective 
around uh, the time that England went to war. And if you all remember World War II, we did not have, uh, we weren't involved for a long time. England fought for a long time. Yes. And most Americans have no idea how bad it got in England. Most Americans are absolutely clueless. And one of my favorite scenes in one of the episodes of this old detective series is at the station, the sergeant at the desk, they're having a raffle to raise funds for the war effort. America's not involved yet. They're trying to raise funds. You know what they're raffling off? An onion. Oh, wow. Sure. And the girl that's the detective's driver, she's acting all casual and cool. And when the detective leaves, she looks at the sergeant. She says, can I just smell it, please? I haven't even seen an onion since Christmas. You're telling you something. You're talking about folks that hadn't even seen an onion in months. What am I talking about? I'm talking about we as Americans don't know what it's like to be poor or right. have a rough life. Amen. Right. We do not even fathom it. And we somehow are going to pick up arms here in the next few weeks or we're somehow going to survive against some military attack. Listen, I got news for you. We need to plan to see the Lord. Amen. And what I'm reading about right here, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because what's on my heart is when, when God calls us to do something, when God calls us to action, my parents taught me that, that obedience is immediately, sweetly, submissively, and completely, or it's not obedience at all. When Dad said, clean your room, he didn't say, clean your room when you feel like it. Clean your room in three years. Yep. Clean your room in three days, or in three hours, or even in three minutes. In fact, it was known in our house that if Dad said jump, you asked how high while you were in the air. Amen. And you better comply with a smile. Amen. Yeah. That's how Dad was. That's just the way I was trained, because that's biblical obedience. It's immediately, sweetly, submissively, and completely, or it's not obedience at all. Dad says, clean your room, and I go, fine. Well, that's disobedience. He didn't say, go clean your room with a bad attitude. You see? But we don't understand these things. And God has called us to himself. God is calling men, calling ladies, calling us all to himself. Why? So we can serve him. He's calling us out of this world to separate from this world, but for a purpose. Not so that we can have casualness, not so that we can have comfort. I was thinking about this recently because several years ago, uh, we were in the uh, North Carolina area and we did the whole uh, 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 tour. Uh, I took my girls and, and my wife over to uh, the, um, the Waldensi Museum there in, in Valdez. And then we went down to Shubal Stearns, uh, old church there and Sandy Creek and all that. And it was like, it dawned on me when we were in this, this replica, this auditorium of the old Waldensi church, that auditorium was twice the size of this. Wood floors, wood pews, and you wouldn't need a sound system for anything. Right. You wouldn't need to waste your money on a sound system. My girl sat up there at the piano and you could close the big, thick, heavy oak doors and hear them out in the parking lot. But you know what we determine what kind of pews we're going to get? It's based on comfort. Sure. What kind of chairs are we going to get for the chair? We want chairs or we want pews? I've heard it. We were in a church recently. When you do the new auditorium, you want chairs? We want chairs. They're more comfortable. Well, how about you ask what God wants first? Amen? How about rather than focusing on our comfort first, we focus on what God wants first? Amen? What am I getting at? I'm, I'm getting at the fact that when you look at this church, Stephen has just been stoned to death. Stephen was a man full of faith. Stephen was a man the church loved, the church adored. He was a leader there, and, and he had been appointed by the apostles. And, and it says he was a man full of faith, and without any reservation at all, Saul stood there, and with their feet, uh, their coats at his feet meant he was the one in charge. I don't need to pick up a stone. I'm telling you to throw the stones. You just set your coat here and go throw those stones. And they, and they slaughtered Stephen. And what did Stephen have? Stephen had the same attitude the three Hebrew children had when, when, they, when they stood before the king and they said, but if not. He said, bow before the idol I have made. And they said, our God is well able to deliver us. But if not, I still won't bow. 
Amen. And Stephen had the same spirit, the same attitude. It doesn't matter the circumstances. It doesn't matter the outcome. I'm going to do what's right, and I'm going to do it right now, even though it seems hard. And so you come into chapter 8, and Stephen has been stoned. It says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. Uh, it says, and at that time, there was slight persecution against the church. They couldn't have AC in the building anymore. Amen? They couldn't have the nice padded chairs when they redid the auditorium. They didn't get the shade of red they wanted. I'm saying they had great persecution. Folks, the devil has a plan and he wants to destroy the work of God. And he does that by attacking the churches and we're going to get into that for a minute. But listen, this attack is a painful attack. He doesn't just... Oh, well, you know, we'll find someone they don't care much about. No, he goes after Stephen. I wonder why Satan wanted Stephen dead so bad. Hmm? Let me tell you why. Because they loved Stephen. And Stephen was a man who had influence in the church. And people were being more drawn unto God. And they were doing great with, with Stephen there. And the devil said, no, we can't have that. Beside this, he's a great preacher and others are going to turn to Christ. We can't have that. We've got to stop him. So what do they do? The persecution comes, and there's great persecution. You see the, the pain of this, but I want you to notice this. It says that there were persecution uh, against the church which is at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And I want you to see this now here down in verse, uh, in verse 4. Let me see here. No, verse 3 with me. Look at verse 3 with me. It says... As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Now let's see. How's, how is Saul, how is the devil going to attack Victorious Life Baptist Church? As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into some of the houses. No, into every house. You know how Satan attacks the church? He comes to your house. He shows up at your door. He comes into your room. He comes into your life. That's how he attacks the church. It's not just a painful attack. He don't mind pain. Hey, listen, the, devil's, the, the devil loves pain. He loves to bring the pain. But more than bringing the pain, he likes to make it personal. He wants to mess your life up. Yeah. Come He's coming into every house. You don't care. Oh, you know what? She's a widow lady. I'll just leave. No. I don't care, widow lady. Oh, this poor guy over here, he doesn't have, he's a father. No, you don't care, fatherless. We're coming after him. He comes into the homes, and it's through the families he attacks the church. Mm -hmm. So often we, we go to church after church after church, and the churches and people say, well, we want a stronger church. We want a stronger church. We want a stronger, you want a stronger church, get a stronger family. You want a stronger family, get a stronger self. It starts with you. It's revival with me at the middle. With focus is here. We want, we desire, what we do is we desire the, the, the private or the personal results of, 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 of revival as long as it happens on a corporate level. But that's not how it works. Revival starts on a personal level yep. and the results are felt on a corporate level. God's not going to bring revival into a church, awaken into a church or any of that until we as individuals realize it is through my life Satan wants to attack my church. It is through my behavior, my thinking, my attitudes, my spirit, myself, this is where Satan wants to attack my church. And that's exactly what he's doing right here. He's going into every house and he's attacking the church. Why? He wants to stop the church, folks. What happens? Well, as he's attacking the church, what do they do? What is the answer? Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now remember, who's the they? Look at verse 4. Who's the they in verse 4? The verse 4 is the people that were scattered from verse 1, that were scattered abroad, except the apostles. It's not the leadership. It, Preaching the gospel everywhere is not for the pastor or the missionary. It's not about the leadership. It's for the people that sit in the seats out here. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, the people that sat out here, when that, when that attack came, how did they answer the attack? Not in the flesh. For though we walk after the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 
for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of stones.